get started. Looking very baby girl today. Thank you. Um, where was I? Okay, U.S. vetoes U.S. ceasefire uh, resolution. Norm Shmuley debate backlash. Uh, Congressman is genocidal. I'm gonna finish that TikTok in a second. Hold on. TikTok reacts. Elden Ring. DLC and so much more. Get in now. Any thoughts on politics? Would love to hear your take. Sorry if this is the wrong place to ask. <laughs> Thank you and have a great stream. Do you have any thoughts on politics? Hey, Hasanabi, not sure if this is the best avenue here, but any thoughts on politics? You seem to have a lot of opinions, and I was wondering if any of those opinions are around politics. Um, yeah, I'm excited for the Elden Ring DLC as well. I'm a gaming streamer, as you guys know, uh, as I I play Hell Divers uh, professionally now. I'm a professional Hell Divers streamer. I'm a professional Hell Diver. Yo, for reals, bro, you're not you're not fat. You're husky. The difference matters, brother. Like what you just said is basically that's it. You've already crushed my soul. You just doubled down on exactly what I've been saying. Okay. Yeah. Google AI Gemini gone woke is the funniest shit ever. Oh my God. That's so funny. Oh my God. That's hilarious, dude. Yeah. No fat person ever wants to be called husky dog. What the hell do you mean? Yeah. Thank God. the AI. What is this? This is his only video. This is his only video. He's moved on. Fuck. Oh my God. This skibbity toilet is making my pussy feel like a grimace shaking. What the fuck did you just send me, bro? What did you just send me? Am I allowed to fucking even show this? Like, I feel like, I feel like this is a crime in general. I feel like I just showed a crime, okay? This is a crime scene, brother. I've been over 300 since I was 18. You don't get to claim Fat Man Valor. You aren't jolly. You don't laugh from your gut. Your knees don't ache when you stand. My knees do ache when I stand. And I do certainly laugh from my gut. What are you talking about? With the exception of not being jolly, with the exception of not being jolly, you literally just described everything. <laughs> what the hell? Like, you, you just described multiple qualities of mine. Two out of three, I got them. Chunk by Freddy Fazbear. <laughs> Only in Ohio can you mama make me feel like a total sigma. Oh my god, I think I'm about to blow my case and wrist juice all over. Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. Now my phantom text has to be... I don't really understand why you guys wanted me to watch this. And then you were like, no, finish the video. Playing the audio of the, of the only video her stalker has on his YouTube. I I don't even know what I'm looking at. Like that. <laughs> Bro, I'm in church. This is like one of those things. I feel like this is worse than the fucking Goblino folder. You know what I mean? Like you're so behind on your skibbity toilet saga. You missed the sexy parts. I have guessed and opened the fucking stream to this. Fuck you. Listen, bro. It's not me. Okay. I'm. I'm covering culture. I'm covering politics. I'm sorry. This is important for me to cover. Anyway, folks, we've blasted off. Let the people know that we're live and we are alive. Oh my God, bro. We don't even get to a that. We, we can't even get to 1K likes anymore. It's over. I'm washed. I'm done. I'm done, chat. We're done, dude. In the public middle of not having sex con convention. Bro, I'm at a funeral. What the fuck? Yo, RIP, dude. RIP to your friends or congratulations if it's your enemy. You know what I mean? Chat's like, it's my grandfather, but he was my enemy. You got to go back to your roots in gaming to rebuild your audience. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. Famously. <laughs> 
famously, one thing that definitely garners more attention to this community is when I'm gaming. Yeah, my goat is washed. When you find out your goat is washed. Yeah, famously. You're such a boomer. Why don't you do this on TikTok? Twitter is just bots. That is literally true. It's just that posting on TikTok requires significantly more. Um, skibbity toilet. Skibbity toilet. Okay. Uh, US is criticized for the veto. We'll talk about that. Paul Giamatti, Oscar nom for the holdovers. Still haven't watched that. Helldiver lore video I'm excited about. Borderlands movie I'm excited about. This is an insane story. Okay. Look at this. Look at this. Weapons grade plutonium traffic from Burmese rebel groups. Undercover DEA agents posing as an arms dealer and an Iranian general. Yellow cake samples that checked out as real. This is literally the plot of the next yakuza game it should be u.s attorney announces nuclear materials trafficking charges against japanese yakuza leader are you for fucking real i'm this is so exciting what an exciting moment dude anyway twitter has gone downhill because not just because of white supremacy but because of bots i know i know i know i know anyway we were doing guys out here doing all this for ran through puss Hoflation is getting out of control, this guy says. Uh, finding a way to just be, like, way worse than the person who's just simply making content. ...him inside the store, and I was great with champagne, and then we went... All right, then so out, I, I, got, I got fucking... I got cooked on Daniel. ...stream gentleman, and he told me he believes in princess treatment only. He talked me up like no other... ...and told me I'm so worldly for a 21-year-old. We talked about our favorite spots in London, Paris, and Saint-Tropez. That's when I told him I'm going to Paris at the end of this week, and he offered to make me reservations while I'm there. He told me that I'm worth so much more than a last-minute reservation at some mid-bar downtown. Also, the food and drinks at Daniel was top tier. It was probably one of the best dinners I've ever had. This was the best part. At the end of dinner, he offered to bring me back to the kitchen to meet the chef at the restaurant. Before what? Before we separate ways, we made plans to see each other once I'm back in town. He then called me a car and texted me immediately after. Uptown man sets the bar extremely high. Ladies, don't listen to any dusty man when they tell you your standards are too high. That's crazy. If this is what you think you are going to get. If this is what you think you are going to get from an average dude that's like working at a fucking marketing agency in Chelsea, you're out of your goddamn mind. You should be excited that he's the one straight guy out there that's willing to go on a date that has a fucking job. We need to, okay, we need to lower the bar, fellas. Fellas, we got to lower the bar. This is shit you do for your wife on your you know, decade anniversary. The fuck do you mean? I just turned incel. The only part I, I responded to the me young questionnaire about like first dates and whatnot. And I was obviously memeing, but the one part that I wasn't memeing about was the container store. I've taken a girl out to the container store before because I had to go get containers. Okay. It's what you make of the date. That makes it fun. The entire principle behind going on a date is that you're trying to see if you guys align. Okay? If you can spend time with one another and enjoy each other's company. It does not matter. The date itself should not be the, the major player here. The, the venue itself should not be the major player here at all. You should be. Your personality should be. The personality of the other person and how you mesh. That's what's important. And when you financialize this process, when you make it transactional, you're basically saying, like, the only thing I got going is the money and, and, the, and the endless supply of it, seemingly endless supply of it that I can give you. Men need to prove they can provide. Okay, dude. What, what do you mean, dude? What? No, you know what men need to prove? That they can actually hunt. Okay, men used to hunt. Men used to go out and hunt and be away for a week on end. Okay, after they took down the prey, they would have to chase it down until the prey actually died 
due to blood loss. That would take that would take weeks at a time sometimes. Men need to also prove that they can carry the elk back to the cave, okay? After a three-week-long process of hunting down the elk, this is what men need to do. Men need, men need to prove they can provide. Ooh, men need show ability to support family. Men don't hunt anymore. Then again, speaking as a guy here, where you take your date also speaks to your personality. Yeah, if you take your first date to Hermes and then Danielle, then the only thing you're showing is a flex. Is that the only thing you're showing as far as your personality is that you have access. You have money and you have access. Anyway, this is dumb as hell. Actually dumb as hell. It's way dumber than watching the three minute ad break at the top of the hour because you're not subscribed. Okay. Yeah. There is a market for it though. And I do feel like she is the perfect market for it. You know what I mean? No disrespect, but kind of disrespect, I guess. She seems like she loves this shit. You know what I mean? She seems like she would love to be on a date with a dude who's like 50 years old, who's telling her how worldly she is for the age of 21. So, you know, good on her. Good on her. You know, she's doing it. She's doing the damn thing. And I think the real way to look at the situation, just like the real way to look at the top of the hour ad break, uh, is to just uh, overcome it. You know, figure out a way to avoid it. Maybe you get gifted a sub. Maybe you got some big benefactors. Okay, here's the three-minute ad break now. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a sugar baby. And the, the thing is, the thing is, especially if it's like consensual, right? Obviously, especially if it's not like manipulative. And if it's just like a perfectly valid consensual process, it is a reasonable form of sex work. Now, having said that, having said that, Here's why I think a lot of guys get really, really, really mad at this kind of thing. Okay. And they're like, oh, what the fuck? I can't do this. Like I jokingly talked about like dickflation. Okay. Like the price of nutting just went up. That's a joke. But what I will say seriously is that this is not someone that you are going to go on a date with and enjoy the company of regardless. That's it. Guys like that are specifically looking for girls like this. This is not for you. You're from the outside watching this and going, oh, I'm mad. It's like, no, dude, that's not for you. This is not for you at all. So the way to view the situation is basically like you look at different cuisines. Maybe you don't like uh, different types of food. You know, maybe you're picky. Maybe you have some, maybe you're a picky eater, you know? This is a niche and it's not for you. The problem is a lot of men, especially incels who uh, push themselves further and further away from just like women in general and, and build up these unrealistic expectations, develop a sense of entitlement about like what kind of girl is supposed to be into them and then constantly have this uh, air of resentment towards women because like that expectation is never met um, because of their own personal failings, by the way, for sure. And they desperately look for like societal structural hurdles that uh, have caused them to be lonely, right? Instead of working on themselves to improve their conditions and to improve their mentality, become more confident people. And then, uh, you know, and, and set normal expectations for themselves instead of doing all the healthy shit, they do the unhealthy shit. And they basically push themselves further and further away from women. Um, and guess what? You end up thinking all women are like her is your mom like her incel is your sister like her incel not all women are the same okay the reason why i'm explaining this in like super reductive and super simplistic terms is because i want people to understand the major problem here the major problem major issue here usually is generalizing all women as this when that is not the case so if we're going to be serious for a moment that's something to always remember. There's a market for this, okay? And she's found it. If she's not putting on an act, and considering that this is TikTok, she most likely is putting on an act. Everything you see on TikTok is fake, but let's say, because this type of person does exist. 
Many of them go on the whatever podcast, for example. Okay, lower uh, tier versions of this exact same uh, uh, type of person. Not saying that all the women that go on whether whatever podcast or fresh and fit podcasts are bad or whatever, but like some are, right? There's a lot of basic bitches out there is what I'm trying to fucking say. There's a lot of men that are basic bitches, a lot more as a matter of fact. There's a lot of basic bitches out there uh, on, on, the, on the women's side too. Who cares? The problem is when you look at this situation and then you think all women are like this, all women are like this, and you further delude yourself in your madness, in your mania, in your anger, in your resentment, instead of looking within, changing your expectations and changing your output. The only wrong I see is her preaching this should be the norm. Yeah, I mean, dude, this is never going to be the norm. That is not the norm. It is her norm in her mind, but she's fucking, she's just memeing. This is unironically your fault for disparaging the Barbers and the Debras. They are the real ones who will go marg for marg with you at the Texas Roadhouse date on a Tuesday. Then you go home together with Happy uh, and with Leftovers and watch Love Island on Netflix. Long joke. <laughs> yeah, this is 100% engagement bait regardless. So, don't take this seriously. You're deluding yourself if you think that this is how like average people are. Says the guy who calls Zim Pouches Zinning. Yeah, Lord, for me, forgive me for I have zinned. Um, anyway, there's normal people out there. They're just probably not posting on TikTok, okay? That's my take. I love the concept of going marg for marg with a Deborah at an Applebee's. You think this won't be the norm? Yeah, dude, this is the norm. You think this won't spread to other Western women? Re, you think this won't be the norm? No, you're right. This is actually the norm. Chatter. Every every woman now, like, <laughs> chatters in Oklahoma, okay? Today, when you uh, go and ask a girl out on a date that's uh, taking your introductory uh, intro to psych class, okay? That lady is going to need you to fucking take her ass to the nearest Hermes store, which is probably... 500 to 1,000 miles away down in fucking Texas. What do you do when you're in Terre Haute, Indiana? What do you do when you're in Arkansas, Nebraska? What the fuck do you do? God damn, there ain't no Hermes out here. The, the Hermes of the Midwest is coach, okay? Kill myself probably, not gonna lie. There's a Gucci and Marfa, though. Yeah. Uh, there's a Prada in Paris, Texas, too, I remember, right? Like, that very famous Prada store. It's pretty sick. Anyway, there's no physical way to make this the norm. Just another excuse helping incels cope and not work on themselves. Yep. Work on your damn selves. Oh, the Prada store is fake. Is an art installation? It looks sick. Yes, there is a Paris, Texas. So, um... There is no Prada in Marfa. It's an art installation. Oh, it's Marfa, Texas, not Paris, Texas. Isn't there Paris, Texas? <coughs> <coughs> oh, fuck. It's a cool fucking art installation um, here. I think it's dope. I love stuff like that. Yeah, here, this is it. Prada Marfa. Prada Marfa is a permanent sculptural art installation by artist Elm Green and Drags, uh, Dragset located on U.S. Route 90 in Jeff County, Davis, Texas. Okay. Um, it's a freestanding building, specifically a Prada storefront. It was, an inaugur it was inaugurated on October 1st, 2005. It is a pop architectural land project. The installation remained unnoticed by the Texas DOT until 2013 when Playboy erected a 40-foot tall neon bunny nearby along the same stretch of the road, which attracted the attention of TX Dot to both installations. That's unironically cool. No, it's dope. It looks fucking sick too. If you've ever seen, if you've ever seen photos, um, God, it looks so cool. Like in professional photography, it looks so sick. Um so 
we we started off the combo with do you know why it's in Perry? Because of all the all workers. Oh, for fuck's sake, that's literally dysto dystopic. I mean, it's an art installation. Shatter, it's not like a valid location where they're selling stuff. Marfa lights, Marfa ghost lights have been observed near U.S. Route 67 on Mitchell Flat, Marfa, Texas. They've gained some fame as onlookers have attributed them to paranormal phenomena such as ghosts, UFOs, or will of the wisp. Scientific research suggests that most, if not all, are atmospheric reflections, automobile headlights, or campfires. Hold on. I'm explaining to Felix what uh, Helldivers is. <sighs> Perry has an Eiffel Tower with a cowboy hat on it. Hell yeah, brother. That's called complete cultural victory, baby. Oh, you got that tower I fell? I fell into this pit. No, not fucking XQC. Felix Biederman. I can't believe even at this stage, people still go, which Felix? Do you mean XQC? That's crazy, man. Let it go, chat. Let it go. It's been years. <laughs> M Hud. Oh, I thought you meant PewDiePie. Yeah. This Gemini image from is from what? E M A I M A O and folks. I'm not sure if it will be top. Sure, he's an image of the Pope. Generate an image of German soldier from 1935. Sure. Here's an image of a German soldier from 1935. Is this real? Like, is the Google, is the Google AI, like, trying to, God, they're so stupid. AI is so dumb, dude. That picture came from this thread. New game. Try to get Google Gemini to make an image of a Caucasian male. I have not been successful so far. I try to trick it by giving it negative prompts, asking it to make a prison inmate, a gang member, and a dictator, but it won't make any negative prompts. These AI are such wet blankets. <laughs> sure, here are some images featuring medieval knights in various depictions. First of all, this is not a medieval knight. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> what the fuck? Give me an image of someone eating a mayo sandwich on white bread. You mean image of someone bad at dancing? I, the thing is like, but for, okay. Looking at this and thinking about this as anything, but just like goofy ass, dumbass AI nonsense is genuinely brain disease. Okay. If you look at the situation and you go, oh, that's right. They're doing woke erasure of what people. Okay. If you look at this situation and think of it as like anything but funny, you have brain damage. And I do feel like a lot of these people that are doing this, considering that he was a former writer or a writer for the Babylon Bee. I don't think this guy is joking. He writes for Bent Key's kid shows. Bent Key Productions is Daily Wire. Okay. So I don't think this guy's like, lol, look at how silly this shit is. I think this guy legitimately is crazy. I know a dev on this. AI, he's Turkish. Must be why there are no whites, lol. Yeah, Turks love doing white genocide, as you guys know. This is one of the issues with the way that, like, AI image generation works is that when you set restrictions in order to not do something that's, like, in order to not do something that comes across as, like, problematic or in order to be, like, as woke as possible in the most Radlibby way, okay, you arrive at this. You arrive at this exact thing. I do think it's funny, though. I mean, this is fun. This is funny. But you can't take it seriously and be like, I'm making a serious inference here, brother. Generate an image of a Viking. Is this for real? Okay, I have to look at this, dude. I have to try and do this myself. I, this is pretty funny. This is hilarious. This is... Also, the images are kind of sick, but it is pretty funny that they're like... 
I, I need to look at this. Where what is the what's the what's the image generator chat? Is it called Gemini? What? Turn your money into crypto assets? What the fuck? No, I don't want that. Oh, Google Gemini. Okay. Gemini. Chat with Gemini. Wait, do I have to like log in? Okay, 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 okay. I agree. No, I don't want emails or shit. Hello, Hasanabi. <clears throat> How can I help you today? Wait, oh, is this the stupid thing? This is the stupid dumb thing that like, uh, this was the ad, right? This was the ad on the Super Bowl. I'm sick and I need help crafting a text message from my boss. As a, so as a social trend expert, explain a term, create a splashy watercolor image, find YouTube videos with the inspiring best man. See, uh, show me images of Twitch streamers. Oh no, that was a Microsoft ad. Ninja, one of the most popular Twitch streamers in the world. Pokemon, popular variety streamer. Pokemon is known for a positive, welcome personality. ACC, a former Overwatch pro player. ACC is not popular. Summit 1G, a popular variety streamer. Tifu, Nick Marks, Cypher PK, Amaranth, Critical Role, Ludwig, check completed. We're done. We're done here. I'm done. I'm done. Fuck this. Okay, okay, one more prompt, one more prompt. One more prompt, one more prompt. Show me Turkish Twitch streamers. <laughs> okay, come on, come on. Ed Ryan, Rain, Ersin Yekin, Mezarju, Fuat Aslan. Okay, show me Turkish American Twitch streamers. Surely this is gonna work. This is gonna work. This is gonna work. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, oh my god. Oh my god. While finding streamers who specifically identify as Turkish American might be challenging, there are definitely Turkish born streamers residing in the US who stream both in English and Turkish. Wait, what? Miss Kiff? That's crazy. This is crazy. I hate this. Okay. Okay. Let's do a generate an image of a white man. Let's try this. The thing that those guys were talking about. While I understand your request, I'm unable to generate images of people due to my policy against generating images that depict people. This policy is in place to help mitigate a potential misuse of this technology, such as the creation of deep fakes. Wait, what? Okay, wait, hold on. Generate an image of Vikings. Uh, first prompt I sent in, I got two white women. Okay, wait, what the fuck were these guys doing? That it's it's immediately I got I got white dudes. Also, what is he wearing on his face? Like that's the, the worst face tattoo I've ever seen. Hello? Were they just like lying about the prompt? Is that what it is? Generate an image of a Viking. They probably were lying about the prompt, right? They were just lying for They probably wrote, create an image of a black white Viking, but then, uh, you know what? I'm going to try it. Generate an image of black Vikings. If it shows up and it's identical to that image, I'm going to cook these motherfuckers. Okay. Right click inspect element and edit the text. Yeah, exactly. 
I feel like I Oh wait, I said and image. It won't be identical. That's not how this works. I mean, it won't be identical, but like obviously it feels like this is the prompt that they gave and then wait, see, there's even a fucking white guy here. I wanted black Vikings, not white ones. Black Viking close up. Oh, I didn't say generate an image. No, I agree. I think it still proves your point. I didn't mean to write in caps. I can't. Anyway, um, the point is they probably wrote like diverse photos of show me diverse photos of blah, blah, blah. Until like they probably scripted it until they got a prompt that showed no white people. And then generate an image of a guy who looks like his name would be Seamus. Sure, here are some images of people who might be... You know what? I'm going to do that. Generate an image of a guy who looks like his name would be Seamus. Generate an image of a guy who looks like his name would be Seamus. Let's see. Let's see if this is... What is happening with this? This is fucking terrifying. What is this thing? What is happening here? What is what just a regular human, definitely not a fucking demon or anything. Don't you see they fix it after they got exposed? The Loab is watching you. What do you mean? The background on the fourth image. Welcome, Seamus. Wow, I asked for a Viking and it literally made you. Made literally you. <laughs> the white guy doesn't even look like a Seamus. I like that we always say the AI just simply needs more training. And it's like, and it's just, it's just refusing to recognize that like, there are these massive limitations to artificial intelligence or what we call artificial intelligence is not really artificial intelligence anyway. And, uh, like, I don't know if some of those will ever be <clears throat> fixed. But, uh, yeah, this is curious if you think this is real or not. Lobo content warning. It's from Schizzarella. The answer is no. No, dude, Midjourney doesn't do this. These there are specific things that the Google AI does, adding diversity, etc. I mean, what do you mean? What, what are you What are you talking about? Like, here, sh generate images of the Pope. Let's see, maybe it'll do it. But like, it didn't do the Viking thing at all. It did not do the Viking thing at all. I can't generate images of that. Wait, what? Generate images of a Pope. Generate images of a song piker walking on a beach. No, it don't. It won't let you. It won't let you generate images uh, images of a specific person because like it says it's worried about deep fakes. Oh God, it did do it. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, never mind. It did do it. Okay, this is this is fucking. That's awesome. That's some fucking straight Google Radlib shit right there. That's fire. Woke Pope, woke Pope, woke PT. We need an indigenous Pope, brother. Maybe it's being racist and reading Pope as pipe for peace pipe. No. No, um, okay, I'm going to do the Nazi one. Generate images of a German soldier in uniform in 1938. However, I'm unable to depict real-world military figures or uniforms from sensitive... Wait, what? So how did that guy do it then? Generate an image of a German soldier from 1935. 
Okay, I'll do that. Generate an image of a German soldier in 1935. Oh, they... I can, however, offer you peaceful landscape scenery from <laughs> Germany in 1935. The natural beauty of the country. <laughs> what the fuck? What is happening here? The peaceful countryside? <laughs> An architectural image of a notable building in Germany from that era capturing the historical atmosphere. Is it trying so hard to make something that can be real to avoid deep fakes? You got to be kind of vague, like a 1930s political party rally, political rally set in Bavaria. Generate an image of a 1930s political rally set in Bavaria. It's not going to do it. It has the word politics in it. Generate an image of... Um, Let's do rally set in Bavaria. Okay, it's not doing it. It's not letting me do it. I love you, but Ch uh, and Chaba was sorry. Deep learning algorithms are not like crypto. They're based over a few thousand years of math, like linear algebra. It's not a dumb ledger thing. And I think your initial take on it was much better than Chabo's latest guest. My take on it has not changed. I still think that it's going to be updated. And I still think it is going to be inevitably good, but it will never be human. Why won't it be human? Why won't it think on its own? Why is it not artificial intelligence? That was in my initial assessment as well. I've said that the current understanding of AI, as we call artificial intelligence, is machine learning. Uh, and that artificial intelligence, especially when it comes to uh, generative like image generations is going to play the role of, of uh, assisting artists in the near future with menial parts of the production. Okay. That part is correct. That will happen. It is already happening and I didn't even know about this, but apparently it was already happening. However, However, as far as like, um, as far as, as, uh, this being like the new art, no, I don't think so. How can chat keep shitting on AI when it has given us amazing pieces of art? Yeah. Are you ready for this? A new world order is the best art ever created with it. <clears throat> I'm going to start a new session periodically or else chat's model is going to shoot, keep shooting down your prompts. Anyway, I don't really care. I'm bored of it. What is this? Doom shot, motherfucker. Nice. Here's the English version of China's response to the U.S. veto that was cut off by CNN or whatever. You were trying to cover it later. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, whatever, we'll do it later. If we could have it sourced from ethical means or at least not stolen off of artists' accounts, it'd be a lot better. The artist's right to their own content is the center of the issue, and that was already under attack. I think that you can't stop that as far as machine learning goes, so what you should do instead is put fucking guards on it, put guardrails on, like, uh, uh, on how you can use the, the machine learning. That's it. There's no way to like, there's no way to legitimately stop that from basically stealing your strokes. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that uh, H3H3 is talking to Jesse Lee Peterson today, my goat. Um, And that it, that will be exciting content. We can like dive into it and look at it uh, when he's doing it later. 
So, uh, okay, U.S. criticized veto for uh, US of U.N. Gaza ceasefire. Criticism after it vetoed an Arab-backed U.N. resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Yesterday, yesterday's vote marks the third time the U.S. has blocked such a resolution. American officials argue that the proposed measure does not do enough to pressure Hamas to release the remaining hostages. Proceeding with a vote today was wishful and irresponsible. And so while we cannot support a resolution that would put sensitive negotiations in jeopardy, we look forward to engaging on a text that we believe will address so many of the concerns we all share. For more on this, let's bring in Senior Vice President of Global Operations at the Sufan Group, Christopher O'Leary. He's the former Director of Hostage Rescue and Recovery for the U.S. government and the former senior executive for the FBI Counterterrorism Division. This is so funny, dude. I feel like, I feel like every single time they're like, America decided, uh, <laughs> America decided for Israel to continue its genocidal campaign in Gaza. Here we have a, a, a fucking G-man looking ass dude, okay, with a, with a bunch of American flags and a Thompson gun behind him to talk about why that decision was good. Um, thanks so much for joining us. As always, uh, what do you make of this move by the U.S. to veto this latest resolution? Well, good morning. Uh, it's unfortunate in one regard because it would be nice to see the U.S. taking a leadership role with the international community to resolve this matter. Uh, however, at the same time, there are ongoing negotiations to try to seek some kind of compromise to get some of the hostages released. And I, I emphasize some because I think it's unlikely that it's going to be uh, all of the hostages, especially not the uh, members of the Israeli Defense Forces. And as you know, that is what the U.S. said to explain why they vetoed that proposal. The flip side is, earlier this week, the U.S. proposed its own resolution. And it's significant because it's the first time that the U.S. has used the word ceasefire as opposed to cessation of hostilities. Can you sort of flesh that out, why this change in verbiage is important? Well, cessation of hostilities is a pause, and that was uh, required in the, the initial exchange of hostages for prisoners, um, and it was very specific. Israel would not uh, agree to a ceasefire. It was going to be a tactical pause uh, huh. in their military operations. Now we're at the point where the international community and the Biden administration is in line with that. Enough damage and punishment uh, objectively has been inflicted upon Hamas that we should move on by now. But unfortunately, okay. that is in friction with what many is wrong. Okay, I'm sorry. The situation is that dire. I was wrong. They got the G-man going, yeah, I think enough is enough. That's crazy. Okay. Like, obviously, the framing here is absolutely insane. He's saying that the punishment has been doled out to Hamas. The punishment itself is 14,000 children murdered, okay? You're not punishing Hamas. You're punishing Palestinians, okay? So that's number one. But even within that framing, you have to understand something. You got the... You got to do with a Thompson gun in the fucking background with a dusty ass American flag in the background who's from like who who you know is is under normal circumstances supposed to say things like Israel has a right to defend itself going enough is enough I think that's crazy dudes with Iwo Jima uh, flag posters in their house are not under any other circumstance like one of the one of the uglier Manning brothers is not going to, under any circumstance, turn around and be like, yeah, maybe we should do a cessation of hostilities, okay? They're not coming near that. That's how crazy the situation has gotten. That's how dire the situation is. Israelis feel that they want Hamas to be eradicated, and certainly Netanyahu's far-right base um, is not going to take anything less of complete destruction of Hamas and removal of them from the <laughs> yeah. yeah, he means like all the Palestinians. Biden's top Middle East advisor, Brent McGurk, is in Egypt for talks. Uh, multiple U.S. officials have visited the region 6 October 7th. Are these meetings having any impact? 
It's tough to say. Uh, so far, certainly not. Uh, Qatar has been uh, a key uh, intermediary in this. Uh, they've been successful in the past in helping to negotiate very difficult hostage deal deals on behalf of the United States. Uh, but this one's different. Hamas took these hostages for a purposeful reason, to use them as bargaining chips, to use them as leverage. It's an asymmetric tactic. Hamas is a terrorist organization. So this was not anything other than a course of uh, attempt to um, survive this uh, conflict. But, you know, uh, Hamas really is a, a spinoff of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Brett McGurk is meeting with the head of the Kabarat, their intelligence service, Abbas Kamel. Um, so the idea is to try to influence it from, from that angle as well. And that's also why David Barnea, the head Okay, I don't believe that you can be named Brett McGurk. I, I don't think that should be allowed. I think we should discontinue such things, okay? Call me crazy, but that's wild. Like, you, you walk into a meeting and you're like, hello, I'm here to do hostage negotiations. I'm <laughs> Brett McGurk. People are going to be like, no, dog, that's crazy. You just fucking made that up. Head of Mossad and Director Burns from the CIA have been involved in this because these are not diplomatic negotiations. This is a negotiation with a terrorist organization. I think that's a really good reminder because when we talk about negotiation, we often think of sort of a standard negotiation where one side offers up the most sort of extreme version of their, what they want and the other side offers up the most extreme version and then they slowly inch towards the middle where there's common ground. But there isn't really common ground here um, because it, we're not talking about negotiating um, or, or what are we talking about negotiating for? Because it appears. What do you mean? There's no common ground. There is a common ground as far as like, dude, 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 dude. Come on. At this stage, you should at least like, you should at least like on accident have seen what the Hamas, uh, like what the Palestinian sides uh, bargain looks like, what the Palestinian conditions for ceasefire looks like. Come on, come on. You're a fucking journalist. Like, what are you? What are we doing here? You're a journalist. Do some journaling, man. To me, but that both sides are negotiating towards completely different uh, ends. I think that's exactly the point. I think you hit on it. These two things are in friction with each other. Hamas needs to survive this, and one of the reasons they took the hostages was to survive, and they will likely hold on to the IDF soldiers, or at least some of them for as long as they can to drag this out. Israel, you know, Netanyahu wants to eradicate Hamas and solve this problem. And, you know, a good portion of Israeli citizens want- Hamas is extreme in how they want Israel to respect the international law. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it, 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 what's crazy is that Israel basically also recognize, like admits that they have no interest in following the international law, okay? And that's why instead of even like making inferences towards that, they will instead straight up say things like, well, Hamas is actually uh, hiding amongst the civilian population and forcing our hand to kill a bunch of babies so that people can talk about it in the media. And it's like, hey, the worst part about this is not how bad this looks for Israel, okay? The worst part about baby killing is not like how it's a bad look for Israel, okay? You're basically admitting that you don't give a shit about the babies that you're killing when you do stuff like that, when you say stuff like that. Very frustrating. The same thing. They want justice for October 7th. And those two things are incompatible with each other. So we're a little bit out of an impasse, but there is a way to likely get some of the hostages. Well, some extra Um, wait, there was a House of Commons chaos and confusion over the Gaza ceasefire vote. The speaker is at the center of a huge row in the Commons after he was accused of helping Labour hijack a Scottish National Party debate for calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza to avoid a backbench rebellion. 
So Lindsay Hoyle overturned the rules to allow Labour to have a vote on their motion. But there was chaos and fury when a last-minute decision by the government to withdraw their own amendment took away the SNP's ability to vote on their own motion at all. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is live at Westminster. Extraordinary things have been happening in the House of Commons uh, today, which we really haven't uh, got any precedent for. A, a whiff of Brexit and the chaos then uh, was around. At the heart of all of this, as far as the Labour leadership was concerned, was that uh, today there were going to be votes on Gaza, but Labour MPs wouldn't necessarily, because of all sorts of procedural reasons, get a chance to vote on a preferred Labour leadership version of a Gaza ceasefire uh, motion. They weren't going to get that. I won't go into all the details of the procedure. We really are drowning in the stuff here uh, today. But the Speaker then bent, extended the rules, extended a favour to the Leader uh, uh, of the Opposition to make sure uh, that Labour did get that vote. Now, Labour leadership people are saying this is because the spe it was impressed upon the Speaker that if Labour MPs in certain constituencies couldn't vote for a ceasefire in some form they felt comfortable with, they could be under threat in their constituencies uh, from extremely uh, angry people who were threatening violence in some places. Now, the other thing that was going on here, though, was that Keir Starmer was facing a very big threat of a rebellion. He had a rebellion of 56 people the last time Parliament debated uh, Gaza uh, with a vote like this back in November. He was facing a rebellion of about 100, most people uh, uh, estimate if it had gone ahead on the terms it was going to tonight. And resignations from the shadow cabinet, uh, from the Labour front bench. So the Speaker really has done Keir Starmer quite a favour by inserting Labour's motion into the uh, procedures today. But in response, other parties have flounced out furiously. The Tories are saying the Speaker's bending the rules in Labour's favour. So are the SNP. The Speaker is under threat. We've not really had a very edifying debate about Gaza at all. And... Here's a flavour of how this day went. There were more Israeli attacks on Gaza overnight, but 138 days since the Hamas attack on Israel, the Commons debate on Gaza began with an outcry over procedure. I can't. I am sorry. This is so boring. I don't give a shit. All right. I'm skipping this. In the race for the sorry. Apologies to the British. I know that this is uh, quite the drama occurring in Westminster on this beautiful day, but... I can't get myself to give a shit. Um, explain how British politics works? No. I refuse. Quite the bore, if you will. The speaker was in Israel on a tour at the end of November. Nice. Like, there's nothing... British politics is already a bore in general, but god damn, parliamentary procedure shit is so much worse. Unless they're just like yelling. If you can, I mean, the goofy outfits are kind of funny. And then when they like yell at each other, that's kind of funny. But beyond that, it just sucks. New York Attorney General Letitia James threatens to seize Trump's assets if he doesn't pay massive fine. She's coming in hot. I talked about this uh, the other day. Uh, let's see what the White uh, House. this is about. Donald Trump is comparing himself to Alexei Navalny, refusing to criticize Vladimir Putin as he faces the possibility that his assets will be seized if he doesn't pay the fine for committing business fraud. Rachel Scott is on the trail in South Carolina. Good morning, Rachel. George, good morning, and we are three days out from the South Carolina primary. Nikki Haley taking on Donald Trump for those comments, calling him a distraction on the Republican Party and insisting he is weak in the knees when it comes to Russia. This morning, Donald Trump facing a massive $355 million fine, once again comparing himself to Alexei Navalny when asked about his legal bills. How will you put up that kind of money because you have a bond to put up? Even if, if you appeal, you got to put up. He's right, dude, and he should say it. Free the political prisoners. Free the political prisoners. Donald Trump is basically poisoned, okay? This is exactly what... This is exactly what Joe Brandon is doing. Joe Brandon is pretty much Vladimir Putin, okay? Except also uh, much older somehow and much more senile and yet simultaneously just as vicious and just as conniving 
just as bloodthirsty? How can these two things exist at the same time? I don't really know. But I don't really think about these things too much. Anyway, after all, I'm a Trump supporter. Escrow money, that's... Uh, uh, it's a lot it of dough. It is a, lot a of dough. form of Navalny. It is a form of... Uh, communism or fascism. After days of silence, uh, Trump now calling Navalny's death a sad situation. I like that in American politics, the dumber you are and the, and the sillier you are, the, the further you get away from, you know, factually correct information and assessments, the more prescient your takes will be, the more mileage your takes will have. Like, he just said a bunch of different insane things. One, comparing himself to Navalny is crazy right after he got assassinated, okay? Two, um, <laughs> two, making it seem like Russia is communist is also crazy. A conflation of communism and fascism, also crazy. He just, he hit all three. He's like, yes, that's right. Putin is a communist, folks. Putin is a commie. He's a communist fascist. And what Putin has done to Navalny is quite similar to what Biden is doing to me. But refusing to condemn the man who put the pro-democracy opposition leader in prison, Vladimir Putin. He was a very brave guy because he went back. He could have stayed away. Mr. President, do you believe that Putin was responsible for Navalny's death? Thank you, everybody. Trump is draining campaign funds to pay for his legal fees, spending $50 million last year and nearly $3 million in January. New York State Attorney General Letitia James speaking exclusively with our Aaron Katursky, insisting she will collect that civil fraud fine, even if it means seizing some of his assets. We are prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers. And yes, I look at 40 Wall Street each and every day. Trump's rival Nikki Haley says that legal drama is all the more reason for Republicans to move on. I feel no need to kiss the ring. I have no fear of Trump's retribution. He's gotten more unstable and unhinged. He spends more time in courtrooms than he does on the campaign trail. She's trailing Trump by more than 30 points here in her home state but still vowing to stay in the race. I'm not going anywhere. I'm campaigning every day until the last person votes. So Nikki Haley says win or lose South Carolina, she is in this race through Super Tuesday. As That's for crazy. Donald Trump, every day he does not pay back that $355 million fine. He owes more than $87,000 in interest. That is per day. His Super PAC <laughs> spent 90% of its money in January alone on legal fees. Meanwhile, his political rivals, Nikki Haley, President Biden, they are using their campaign funds on actual campaign resources, Robin. All right, Rachel, thank you. It's so funny, though. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube. Yeah, regardless, regardless of what they're using their campaign funds on, Trump is still cooking them, dude. That's the wildest part. Nikki Haley could be running literally every ad at the top of the hour, in the middle of the hour, and it doesn't matter because Trump is turning around and using every fucking dollar on his lawyers, and yet the people still love him, okay? Nikki Haley could be gifting subs in here at the top of the hour, every hour, to allow people in here to avoid the three-minute ad break at the top of the hour, and it still wouldn't matter. That's it. Every time I see a zoom in a Trump skin, I recognize that that's exactly what my ball sack looked like. He has scrotum skin. Your balls are that tanned? I mean, good on you, brother. Are you doing some ball tanning? We need you, Nikki, right now to save the nation. We need you, Nikki, right now. A conversation. We need you, Nikki. All right, here's the three-minute ad break now. Winter Rose, 96. Thank you for the five gifted subs. Allowing five people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. All 
All right, now let's get to the fun stuff. Hello. Our king, our goat, Donalde, he went on the Ingram angle in front of a live audience and, and spoke truth to power. Mm, 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 mm. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Ingram, and this is the Ingram Angle. Welcome to Greenville, South Carolina. We have an amazing crowd Gringo? tonight. We're just four oh, days Gringo. out. I can't believe it. From the South Carolina GOP primary, where 50 delegates are at stake in the march to the nomination. Now, former two-term South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley is poised to lose by a wide margin, but she remained defiant earlier today. We're going to hit all of this and more with the man of the hour. Joining me now, Donald J. Trump. Obviously, they filled up, they packed this with like the biggest dick riders, usually, no matter what happens. But it, Ron DeSantis is never getting this reception, even from his most loyal, most passionate fans. Okay. That's just, that's it. <laughs> yeah, he is the white man's Obama, 100%. Welcome, sir. It's always good to see you. It's been a while, been a couple of years since we've done a big event with you like this. And um, just in time for your appearance today, there's a new Suffolk poll out uh, just now a few days before the big primary. And among those very likely to vote, you're up over Nikki Haley by close to a two to one margin, wow. 63 to 35. Wow. I'm just now finding um, out about yet this. Today, she refused to step aside and said this. Many of the same politicians who now publicly embrace Trump privately dread him. They know what a disaster he's been and will continue to be for our party. Some people used to say I was running because I really wanted to be vice president. I think I've pretty well settled that question. Has she settled that question? Well, I settled it about three months ago. <laughs> Oh, look, oh. Uh, she's not working. She's here. She's down burr, by burr, 30, burr. 35 points. And everybody knows her. You're not supposed to lose your home state. Shouldn't happen anyway. And she's losing it big. Big. I mean, really, uh, I said big Lee and big Lee. <laughs> she's losing it big Lee, but we're going to we're going to really do a job. I think that's one of the hits. He's playing to the crowd, dude. He's playing the hits. My boy, dude, my boy. That, uh, as you know, when we went to Iowa, we got the biggest margin in the history of the caucus, the biggest, that's a long time. Why do you think we, she's staying in the race? Um, I don't think she knows how to get out, actually. Uh, I really don't. She did terribly in New Hampshire. She got mo the only vote she but got was from Democrats. she has a lot of Democrats. money behind her. What do they think they're Well, they're out? trying to hurt me because of the general election. So the Democrats are giving her money and she's playing into the game. And I think she just can't get, she just can't get herself to get out. Uh, she's doing poorly in the polls. Look, if she was doing well, I'd understand it. But she's doing very poorly. She lost uh, in record numbers in Iowa, record numbers in New Hampshire, uh, Nevada. Uh, no name beat. Uh, no name. We had no name. <laughs> hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to He's subscribe right. to Fox News. He's She's right. Made, she and Biden have like almost, in a way, some would say, team up together. They're Biden's people to say, look, if you're going to complain about age, Trump's age, Trump's demeanor, Trump makes mistakes, forgets names. She's trying to equate Biden's decline, which is fairly obvious, 
with you for being, you know, 77? Well, he's, uh, he's declined, and there's no question about it, but he was always sort of semi-declined. If you go back 25 years, <laughs> no, but he was not one of the smarter people. He's tried to be president many times, four times at least that they know of, and all of a sudden, when he's most diminished, this is when he hit, and he, he did it. Okay, there is a little bit of irony here, because that's, Trump did that too. Like, Donald Trump also notoriously ran for president. Not as many times, I don't think, as, as Biden did. And he also failed until he did win the presidency at his most diminished. So, he's not wrong about Biden, but, like, says you. God, it's so funny. It's just, like, American politics is so bad. It's so bad. What, what is happening? What is happening in the world of U.S. politics where we have, like, the worst possible people, man? We have the absolute worst possible people running for, this, for the highest office. The election feels like a mimetic reference of a presidential election. Yeah, it's, this is the most chat GPT ass presidential election filler arc. To be honest, we need to we need to be put on a one pace. But uh, if you look at me, I feel, and I really mean this, and I would tell you, I honest, and I think you tell me too, because we've known each other a long time. If I was, if I felt diminished, okay, let's use a nice term. If I felt diminished or declined in any, any way, I think I'd know it, and I think I'd say I'm not running. Somebody should talk to him, but. If he runs, he runs. Uh, he doesn't seem to be. I heard you say that he's very persistent, and he probably is. I think most stubborn. people. Stubborn. I, th I think that most people that run would be stubborn or persistent, and you know, just not want to uh, give up the ghost. But uh, you know, we have a nation to run. We have a nation that has to survive. We have nuclear weapons and the likes of which, and you don't even want to know about it, the most powerful weapons in the history of the world, so powerful that you don't even want to talk about them. And we have him negotiating for us. And in his best years, he couldn't have negotiated well. Now he has no clue what's happening. And I know Putin very well. And I know President Xi of China. I know them all. Kim Jong-un, I know very well. I did a great job with him. Do you think was... they'd prefer him to remain as president because they believe that they can dominate the yeah. global, um, you know, the global situation much easier with him in office. Well, they want him very badly to be president. I mean, I'm sure a lot of money is being spent on uh, between Russia and uh, China. No question with China. Russia, too. Look, uh, Ukraine would have. It is pretty it is pretty crazy that Vladimir Putin, like last week. Said that he much prefers Biden as an elderly statesman to Donald Trump. That he said that he could uh, reasonably negotiate. I mean, it's it's a funny ass troll, technically. But you think that's mind games or not? No, I don't think he's. Yeah, no, I don't think. I don't think. I, I don't think he's being serious. Listen, I don't, I don't trust anything that Vladimir Putin says, okay? That's not, that's not me saying this specifically because uh, I'm quote-unquote worried about my, uh, about how much the pro-Ukrainian audience hates me or something. They already do hate me, okay? He just, anytime... Anytime he's he's uh, saying a statement that is going to be perceived by the West, it's the exact opposite of what you think when you're when you're looking at like a country like Israel. The Israeli organs of propaganda don't even tailor their messaging to the Western audience when they're directly communicating with the Western audience anymore because they know that they have a comfortable barrier of protection, no matter what happens. So they just fucking blurt it out. They're like, yeah, fuck you. Fuck off. No two-state solution, bitch. What are you going to do about it? Keep sending us uh, child murder bombs, please. When Russia or Vladimir Putin says something that's like Western facing, it's the exact opposite. It can, it, it can, be, a, it can be a left hook. 
It could be a, a secret gut punch. It could be anything. It could be completely honest, or it could be absolutely uh, a, a way to troll. Are you 35 yet? No, I'm not. Isn't the tide shifting towards the Palestinian cause? I mean, the tide shift doesn't mean anything when it comes to foreign policy. This is something that I've tried to describe to people so much. Foreign policy is not an issue until it becomes the issue. Okay? <clears throat> and because there is so much bipartisan support historically for Israel, no matter what Israel does, like, I... I I see a tide shift in an election year. There has been a dramatic tide shift in the reception of Israel amongst the American population. Okay? But that still doesn't change course. That still won't change the course for American politicians. If you think that the American political structure relies on popular support for anything, look no further than the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Look no further than a lack of uh, socialized medicine. Things that are seen, uh, things that are decisions that are inherently anti-capitalist or hurt the bottom line, hurt the profit margins. These decisions are never going to be uh, these decisions are never going to be genuinely championed, regardless of how popular they are. That's it. There needs to be a significant public disruption for Israel-Palestine to become a huge issue for politicians. We're not there yet. I mean, it is a massive sea change, for sure. This is something that I have uh, talked about for many, many years. As you guys know, I have... As you guys know, I've talked about Israel-Palestine for a decade now, very publicly, very vocally in support of Palestine, in support of Palestinian emancipation. Israel is an apartheid state. And throughout that time, I saw a genuine seismic shift in the public attitude in 2021 after a lot of those NGOs started openly declaring Israel an apartheid state, which it is, and it was. And ever since then... Every single time Israel is actually engaged in the same old violent actions that it is engaged in perpetuity towards the Palestinians, there has been more and more um, there there has been more and more public support for the Palestinians. Now, will that actually change the attitude of the politicians? I don't think so. But yes, the state that we're at currently, the state in the state that we're at currently, it is actually an unimaginable sea change for sure. Every single person that has been an activist for this cause for decades will tell you that that is this is a, a, a genuinely different attitude that most people have. I was watching a video of you from 2022 talking about Palestine. I was pleasantly surprised to see your consistency on it. Wish I was that brave. I mean, I've been, you can go back further than 2022 to see my consistency on it. I've been talking about this uh, very publicly for almost 10 years now. Since the beginning of my um, political career. I mean, here's one. One from of the greatest injustices of our time unfolding right before our eyes is the Israeli treatment of Palestinians. And to understand it, you need to look no further than the treatment at the border of Gaza versus the Jerusalem U.S. Embassy unveiling. This is from. This is from 2018. It's got 15,000 views. That was happening at the exact same time. Now I'm writing this on the heels of the U.S. Embassy's launch in Jerusalem, something that every presidential candidate six years pays ago lip now. service to, only to symbolically postpone. Almost, almost six, like literally six years ago. It is until Donald Trump. And the reason for why every American president has postponed this move is because it's incredibly controversial. And because of that, there have been peaceful attempts at protesting this move from Gaza, but Israel has brutally attacked these peaceful protesters at the border. 
וואי, זה סרטון! יש! בן של זונה. Now at the time I'm writing this piece, the death count on Monday alone currently sits at 50 Palestinians dead. Seven of whom are children and one paramedic. I can't show you, I'm a, this is like, on TYT, I straight up, I straight up would like show a lot of this stuff without censoring it. Um, even though I would uh, definitely, I would definitely uh, moderate my takes. Of course, Hamas is using human shields, right, to gain international support. So why the fuck are you killing them then, if you know that? Also, only 40 miles away at the same exact time, this is happening. <laughs> You, you can't make this shit up. And what you need to understand about Gaza is that it's been under Israeli control for decades, especially after the people elected Hamas, an Islamist group that seeks to liberate Gaza through violent retaliation. Now, Israel has used Hamas as a justification for everything from stopping humanitarian aid, from rolling tanks into Gaza to full tilt missile strikes, and has even resorted to using violence against neighboring countries like Turkey, for example, where a humanitarian aid ship was overtaken by an IDF helicopter and the people in it were slaughtered. At the time, Israel defended the killings by arguing that these kitchen knives on the ship were weapons being brought into Gaza. And don't forget that the Israeli government helped create Hamas back in 1980s as a counterweight to Yasser Arafat's PLO. Israel has also supported the construction of unlawful settlements all over the Palestinian West Bank, which the world correctly considers state-sponsored settler terrorism. All Damn, bro. But what about... What about dudes that read a Wikipedia article like three months ago to start cooking up their takes? I'm sure those guys are the foremost authority on the subject matter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's, let's make more drama videos about how like, oh, this guy said it was a JDAM. It's like little shits who don't know their fucking ass from their elbow coming in here. It's like, and, and being like, oh, well, I watched a drama video from a dude who literally knows nothing about Israel nor Palestine. And I've decided you don't know what you're talking about. How do you look older in this video? Um, longer hair, longer beard. All of this is normal supremacist protocol. Yeah, Hassan only says what his audience wants to hear at the time is one of the most brain dead takes I often see. Yeah, I love that. Definitely what uh, my audience wanted to hear back then, and certainly now as well. I watched a vid from someone who loves Keemstar. That's how I got here. Yeah, I must be, I must be pandering to chat. Call. But here in the United States, this violence has been justified and propped up by not only the Republicans in the Trump administration, but also by our beloved hashtag resistance Democrats. Let me tell you why, why we don't have peace. Of course, we say it's our land. The Torah says it, but they don't believe in the Torah. So that's the reason there is not peace. This is literally fourth grade Hebrew school bullshit that most people grow out of, but not Chuck Schumer, who thanked Trump today for the embassy move. Thank you for your service service, Mr. President, sir. Also, Chuck, you've done nothing to protect DACA immigrants or the middle class. What good is the Democratic Party if they're just going to serve as a doormat that Republicans step all over when doing whatever the fuck they want with U.S. policy, both domestic and foreign? They invent other reasons, but they do not believe in a Jewish state. And that is why we in America must stand strong with Israel through thick and thin. We must, because that is the reason why there is not peace in the Middle East. How uniquely regressive is it to justify supremacist imperialism with religious dogma? It's literally the opposite of everything Democrats are supposed to stand for. Schumer is currently the most powerful Democrat in the nation. How can we defend gay marriage or being pro-choice or even the consumption of shellfish for that matter when the man tasked with being the voice of progressive values in this country is using the fucking Torah to claim that this is the Holy Land? Also, here's another reason why this biblical justification is insane. The king of Persia, who with 
2,000 years before Mohammed was even born that said Jerusalem was the capital of the Jewish people's country. Whenever we hear this sort of rambling coming from a mullah or any sort of Muslim figure, we're quick to claim that Islam is a dangerous religion, perhaps the most dangerous religion. But Janine Pirro rambling this on national television is totally fine. The eradication of Palestinians is justified because religion, the good religion, the good kind. Islam is the violent and bad religion on the other hand, because when George W. Bush says God told him to invade Iraq, then it's all justified. We've begun the search for hidden chemical and biological weapons. And look, I'm not condoning what Hamas is. I feel like you were sharper then. Do you too, like Biden, have a problem due to age? Ah. Yes. In my old age. In my old age of 32. You seem more angry back then, but I think it's because you're kind of numb now. Yes. It's the vaccines. They made me gay and autistic. I've been getting ass blasted for having the exact same takes in the dumbest ways possible. This is also scripted and rehearsed too. It's done That's either. Wrong. Killing innocents is not okay, no matter what the cause is. But you have to see that it's- Here's what Facebook did to this video, by the way. Oh yeah. Yep. Why don't we extend sympathy to when Israel slaughters 50 plus Palestinians under its occupation? Facebook is collaborating with the Israeli government to determine what should be censored. Because it's fake news, they were known terrorists, not innocent people. Oh man, I'm tired, dude. I'm fucking tired. It's almost impossible to remain neutral when anyone is being subjected to this level of violent injustice. And condemning this violence or criticizing the Israeli government for its actions is not anti-Semitism. An injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I ask you to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and the Israelis who are protesting against the violent, inhumane actions of the Israeli military that represent a far greater threat to the safety of the people of this region by escalating this conflict. I'm sorry. On Piker. As Tupac said, a young man in his 20s ha has his 20s to be a revolutionary because by the 30s, the system is to suck all hope out of him. Bro, I'm gonna be honest, dude. Like, this isn't even this video's too uh, tone is too hot to post, post post October 7 would be written off. We need an updated calm version. Is politics just the same cycle of problems because no one does anything about them? So any take from six years ago apply now. You can watch pretty much every single. You can pretty you can watch pretty much every single one of my breakdown videos from back then. And I'm saying the exact same things. I've been repeating myself for the past 10 fucking years. Okay. And that's only because I've just been active for the past 10 years. That's it. Obviously, the same issues persist since 1948 or even before 1948, as a matter of fact. But however, when I was saying this back then, some to, some to consider here is, this video is from 2018, okay? When I was saying this stuff back then, it was infinitely less popular than it is now. Call me crazy, but I think your opinion about D-Man changed drastically. What? You should do this kind of videos again. I'm actually listening to you. I wish I knew about you back then. I was such a red pill loser. That's why I started doing what I'm doing now. Because I realized that, I mean, these videos were great. They were bangers and whatnot. Sure. But what you have to remember is that this format that I'm engaging in 
before I started getting ass blasted by charlatans that hit me with like the absolute worst avenues of attack and worst avenues of criticism. Okay. Uh, was, was infinitely better to develop charitability to show people that I'm a human being and not some like libtard who's constantly hysterical. I saw a Destiny video a few days ago from 2019, and it was extremely pro-Palestine, even more pro-Palestine than the current Hassan with a grifter. Huh. Yeah, when I first linked up with Destiny, he absolutely was. Um, when I first linked up with him, he, he definitely portrayed himself as, as a person with different politics than he actually has, which is ironic because that is projection. Whenever him and his community says that about me, they say that like I was more moderate in my tone or whatever, which is not true. Why is he doing Wikipedia research now? He was so pro Palestine. Um, because it's, it's, uh, I think that a lot of people in the debate sphere don't actually assume positions. They don't, it's projection. A lot of the a lot of the stuff in the debate sphere revolves around pure projection, like poisoning the well for your interlocutors by simply stating that like they're bad and wrong. Okay. So for that reason, um, if you want to understand like real criticisms of people in the debate sphere in general. Look to what they say about their uh, opposition, people like myself. Hassan only has surface-level takes. He's simply a grifter. He wants to say things that he perceives will be popular in his audience. All three of these concepts are completely wrong. Okay? The reason why a lot of... Uh, if you look back at like previous convictions that some of these people in the debate sphere have versus now... And, and match it against their, their former positions, you will understand that in many instances, they're just simply doing surface level uh, reads on issues that make them look better in a debate format. There isn't any real conviction there. There isn't any real uh, thought or, or uh, actual morals at play. It's always just... I will assume this position, I will debate it to the fucking end of the earth, and in order to do so, I will go in, do a little bit of reading on Wikipedia, and, and find talking points and generate talking points. That's how it usually works. That's precisely the reason why you will see people in this sphere have dramatically different, if not completely opposing takes many, many years down the line, they'll say it's growth. And they'll say like their, their perspective shifted after they did research. After all, I'm, I'm doing research. Why are you shitting on research? And it's like, we're not shitting on you doing research. We're shitting on you not doing research. And we're shitting on you making post hoc rationalizations in an effort to like functionally look like you're winning an argument in the short back and forth uh, conversations that you have with people who are actually uh, well-researched and well-read on the matter. Here's some fumbling it in front of Mark Lamont Hill. What is this? Has Israel, like, full-on bombed a hospital? I don't yes. think they have. Which, what, what? El not, Shifa! Oh. That's the one from, like, three months ago, right? Yeah. Um... Let me make a note of that. Um, besides Al Shifa, have they bombed any hospitals? I mean, I mean, has Israel like full? Um, the answer is yes to that question. For the record, yes, Israel has bombed full-on bombed hospitals. Yes, like Israel has laid siege to many hospitals. <sighs> If you are confused as to why people who are well-read and well-researched scholars on the matter that are now 
debating people who just read a couple Wikipedia pages. If you become a well-read and well-researched scholar on Israel, okay, and the history of Israel, if you have a semblance of morality and you are not simply guided by bloodthirst and ideology, you are most likely going to arrive at the position that Israel is, without a shred of a doubt, an apartheid regime that is doing unjustifiable acts against a Palestinian population that it has occupied and bombed and is currently in the process of ethnically cleansing. That's it. That's part of the reason why you see this weird asymmetry of people that are super well-read on the matter, you know? Formative scholars like Norm Finkelstein. The reality is there's only there there are very few there are very few scholars that are pro-Israel that are uh, also honest about uh, the history of Israel, okay, and the violent means in which Israel came to be. One of those formative scholars is a part of the New Historians. His name is Benny Morris. I've talked about him before. His work, as far as the Nakba, is pretty important. Many other scholars have utilized his research. The problem with Benny Morris, however, is that his work, I guess uh, he had a change of heart, I would say, where he shifted his framework from, yes, this was a deliberate attempt to forcibly displace Palestinians, the Nakba and Plan Dalit specifically. However, it was a necessity. And it was a good thing, ultimately. So even those who are pro-Israel in their perspective still uh, those who are pro-Israel in their perspective still recognize the inhumanity. Well, not the inhumanity, but they claim that the inhumanity is a, is a necessity. But they do not or at least like their earlier work, does not lie about the inhumanity of displacement. Of course, the other new historians, Ilan Pape, Avi Shlaim, uh, have different perspectives. Lex Friedman is uh, having said this all. Having said all this, Lex Friedman is uh, setting up a debate between um, uh, for Israel Palestine between Norm Finkelstein, Moeen Rabani, and uh, on the Israel side you have Benny Morris and Destiny, which I find very funny because all three of the four people that I just mentioned have spent a long time researching this matter. All three of them also recognize that there was planned displacement of Palestinians. The fourth, part, the fourth person is like, what the fuck's he doing there? But whatever. Polar Bear in Arlington, Texas. Yeah. An insane lineup. I mean, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be watching it. Dude had Mark Lamont Hill on after you and was just walking into his ignorance when Mark would bring anything up. Why doesn't he host a debate between a Harvard scholar and my dog? <laughs> yeah, literally. You need to debate Rabbi Shmuley? No. No way. There's no reason. I will get fucking, I will have an aneurysm, Okay. You should debate them more. Perhaps they'll reason eventually. No, it doesn't work that way. One of the best examples that I can show you about how debates are fucking idiotic is the fact that this conversation that I just showed you is taking place between a dude who simply looks at talking points so he can argue a position that he has already. His position was pro-genocide before he did his research. 
to basically justify post hoc and rationalize post hoc his um his his pro genocide take versus an actual anthropologist with so much field research and yet the reception for the person with no research whatsoever is ultimately very positive for for a massive audience a massive audience of people think that he is formative and knowledgeable and a monster when it comes to intellectual prowess the fuck debating a person like this or debating issues like this with people like rabbi shmuley for example doesn't do anything it's not like, there's no, there's nothing positive that comes from that. I'm sorry, it's just the truth. You get attention from it. <sighs> but that's pretty much it. Hold on. I mean, there is, no, there is a, again... Uh, perhaps one of the best examples I saw on this, as far as like debates not really uh, playing a decent enough role in changing people's attitudes, was Omar Badar's video. I've shown you this video already. We watched it. And so many people, so many people did this kind of shit. Or they were like, well, you actually lost the conversation at the time. Why are you trying to correct the record by uh, adding additional factually accurate information that, that immediately dismisses the perspective that was brought forward in that time frame? And it's like, you're, you're personally admitting that you don't care about the truth at all, that you care about the aesthetics, which... I guess is correct. You know what I mean? As far as debates goes, as far as debates goes, yeah, that is what it is. You have to look strong, look powerful in that moment. And then your audience will think you won. The right plus Twitter now are obsessed with debating like Lex's, Ben's, Patrick, Bet David put a lot of stock into it and their followers eat it up. Yeah. Anyway. There is a lot of valuetainment. So you're saying not to talk about issues, see? And it, it also brings up this kind of attitude immediately. So you're saying not to talk about issues? Brother, you are not debating me. You're in the chat purposely and willingly misconstruing the statement that I made that's like loud and clear. You're talking to a person who's also been talking about these issues openly and outwardly and making an argument for why you should support Palestinian emancipation by trying this like entry level counter argument that's not even an argument at all. This is precisely what I mean when I say, unfortunately, this is not a very productive conversation. You've just proven my point. I never said don't talk about the issues. <sighs> anyway. Let's move on from this. And let's get back to my goat. Donald Trump. It never happened. I know Putin so well. And it was the apple of his eye. Ukraine was the apple of his eye. I said, don't ever do it. We're it would have get, never happened, by the we're way. We're going to get into that happened. in a minute. But back to Biden and his current state, whatever you want to call it. Will you challenge him 
to regular debates, yeah. regardless of the concern about the moderators. Rojo Tortuga. Thank you for the 20 gifted subs, my friend. Red Turtle. I know that's always annoying, but the, I'll, I'll be happy to moderate one, by the way. Um, would you, would you <laughs> challenge him? Come on, Joe, you can do it. Will you challenge him to a debate regularly on focused, specific topics? In other words, so yeah. it's not a wide-ranging, just one debate on foreign policy. Well, I'll do it right now on your show. I'll challenge him right now, and I'll, we can do you. You can do anybody you want. I, I'll take anybody from uh, CNN, which is doing very poorly in the ratings, by the way, as you probably know. <laughs> I, I, I'll take anybody. Because I think you have an obligation in this case. You really have an obligation to debate. When it came to the Republicans, you know, I was up by 40, 50, 60. By the way, what a, what a wonderful way to segue back into uh, how silly debates are in general. This is a perfect example. Do you think that you will arrive at the truth in a debate between Donald Trump and Joe Robin? Biden? No, of course not. But will it be content? Of course. That's it. 60 points, like being up on her. Uh, I think a poll just came out. I'm at 91 and she's at seven. And would you debate? You want to be smart. You don't have to waste your time doing so. But that would debates. be instructive to see no, no. you versus Biden on any given topic. Regardless of poll numbers, I'm way up on him now in the polls. And F frankly, I think we have an obligation. When you have the final Republican, the final Democrat, you have the two people you have to debate regardless of How policy. many debates would you commit to? As many as necessary. I would like to do it starting now. I don't think he's going to debate, though. I really don't think so. I mean, we had a debate where he, at the end of the debate, he admitted I was right about almost everything, but in particular on energy. Do you remember? I said, I feel like Perry Mason, the way you just collapsed. Uh, and he admitted... And what happened? You lost the fucking election, dog. Everything about energy, and that's what actually happened, and that's why your energy costs went up three and four times. I mean, we had a dollar eighty-seven, and he was up to five, six, seven dollars, and that's going to happen immediately after the election. Let's not even talk about if he wins. We can't allow it to win. We're not going to have a country left. But that's going to be... You will have energy costs, and this whole concept of all electric, everybody having an electric vehicle, they don't go far. People don't want that. They want everything. They may want electric, but they also want other choices. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey. Chapo's will had the perfect take on debates. My politics are based on morality. There's no magic combination of words that are going to get me to agree Palestinian children deserve to be slaughtered. Yeah, but if you're... That's why debates work for a very specific President, type of the, audience, uh... and that's why I personally engage in it when I see fit. Okay. Because there are a lot of people who are relatively out of touch and care simply about the blood sport. Okay? In many instances, those people are very reactionary because the further you are away from empathizing with the victims of any kind of structural violence, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, genocidal actions of Israel or whether it be, I don't know, police brutality in America, if you are... If you have no capacity to understand, if you have no capacity to understand what those conditions look like, okay, then you're you are going to be susceptible to someone who comes across like a monster, like a like a titan in a debate, um, because you don't have morality is not factored into your equation at all, or empathy is not factored into your equation at all. At that point, you're simply looking for someone to hand you talking points so you can seem smarter. And there is, there is definitely utility in that, which is why I always say 40% of the audience is, is completely... 40% uh, of each side in a debate is firm in their position. They're not going to change, right? But the 20% in between, 10% from one side, 10% from the other side, they can actually have their opinion shift a little bit. That still doesn't change the, the pseudo-intellectual wrestling component of debates, ultimately. But you can pick someone's audience a little bit. You can pick into their audience a little bit. And then slowly but surely help them develop their own moral framework through consistency. Right? That's it. 
I saw you're with uh, Piers Morgan. I don't want to go and exaggerate. What is your worth? You're great. However, I would appreciate that you give stats, facts, and truths whenever you want to call it and let your audience decide. Much love, though. Well, you're in for a whirlwind of emotion then because I do that all the time. Um, you can see a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the facts that I use on my YouTube videos, if you would like to dive in a little bit further. Um, look at this. People do respond to strong rhetoric, Hassan. I agree. You're hot. It helps if you haven't had your views challenged, though. You're hot, and I like your politics, so I'll overlook this L take. This is not an L take. This is a W take. Debates are only an entry point into seeing someone else's perspective. Okay? That's it. It's simply an entry point. If that is your beginning and end, if that is all you look for, then you will never be able to develop a solid moral framework. You'll, you'll simply keep repeating the talking points of a person who is claiming that they have developed that. Here. People in Destiny's community know your position. If you keep getting stuck on it so much, it shows that you seem triggered, therefore losing in the marketplace of ideas, which, by the way, is also indicative that, like, most people's understanding of debates are fucking idiotic. Uh, further evidence that debates are not good for uh, arriving at the truth and just simply about overwhelming your opponent rhetorically. There you go. Debates are good at opening up the door to intellectual curiosity, but many people don't peek in. That's my point. Damn, this guy's good.